It was the early 1990s and Richard Osman's star was rising. The Cambridge grad was finding success as a television producer. Then, he hit it big as the sidekick on the BBC TV game show, Pointless. Okay, well, there's one final person I need to introduce you to, and he is the keeper of all the pointless facts and figures. He is my pointless friend. It's Richard. From the outside, everything looked great. But behind the scenes, Osman was suffering. My addictive behavior has always been food. It has been since I was incredibly young. And it's, it, it's not seen as... It doesn't have any of the sort of doomed glamour of drugs or alcohol or anything like that. We don't always think of food as addictive. Sure, there are candies and snacks that we can't get enough of. But food addiction? And food is a tricky one because booze and drugs, you can just give up. Unbelievably difficult, but, you know, a zero tolerance policy. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're addicted to food or to, or to love or all these things that are sustaining, you do still, <laughs> you still, still have to have them. Osmond struggled with food addiction since he was a child. At this point in his life, he's figured out how to manage it. He's gone on to build a career as a best-selling author, and with his success, he's been vocal about his experiences with food addiction. In an interview with the BBC, he said there hasn't been a single day in his life since he was nine years old that he didn't struggle with his relationship to food. So on today's episode, we're talking about food addiction. Can some foods be addictive? And how are our bodies affected by it? Welcome to Body Unboxed. I'm your host, Anahad O'Connor. I'm here with our resident nutrition expert, Professor Joan Salji Blake. Dr. Joan, welcome. Hello, Anahad. Dr. Joan, there's a lot of new research on this very controversial subject of food addiction. And seriously, I can't wait to dig deeper into all of it with you. You are so right. Food addiction is a hot topic right now. As we heard just now in that unbelievable cold open, there may be people who are addicted to food in the same way that people are addicted to drugs or alcohol. So today we're going to break it all down. And after you listen, be sure to subscribe to Body Unboxed so you catch our bonus content where we get into the science behind each episode. But first, Let's introduce today's guest, Dr. Ashley Gearhart. She's on the cutting edge of food addiction research. She's one of the world's foremost experts on this topic, and she has a ton of incredible knowledge to share with us. Dr. Gearhart, first of all, welcome to the show. It's so great to have you today. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to chat with you both. Thanks for being here. So we all know about alcohol and drug addiction and cigarette addiction. Addiction is not a new topic, but this idea of food potentially being addicted, this is something that for a lot of people, it's hard to wrap their heads around. So can you be addicted to food? Yeah. So I think that is a great question. And I would say we come at that from two ways. The first is when we look at the individual, when we look at a person and we look at their relationship to the foods that they consume, can people show those core indicators of an addiction? You know, we use the same diagnostic criteria to diagnose any sort of substance addiction, whether it's nicotine or cocaine or alcohol. And that's behaviors like people losing control over their intake, having such intense cravings that they can't focus on other things. They know that they're having really significant physical or mental health problems because of their use, and they still are consuming in the same way. And that oftentimes people will try and cut down, try and consume in moderation. And despite really wanting to, they keep failing. And I would say there's a growing scientific consensus that these core behavioral indicators of addiction are apparent for about 15% of the adult population in the United States and about 12% of children. That's pretty striking when you compare that to legal and easily accessible addictions like alcohol addiction or tobacco addiction. It's really around that same 15% or so benchmark of the percentage of adults who seem addicted to that product. With kids, clearly, you know, we don't have little kids who are addicted to alcohol and cigarettes and, you know, pot because we protect them from it. Not so much with the sorts of foods that we think trigger an addictive response. And that's that kind of second piece. So I'd say where there's less controversy that people can look like they're showing signs of addiction, the controversy really has felt like it's pivoted to 
well, what is it that can trigger this addictive pattern of intake? When we first started doing this work, we called it food addiction because we really felt like we didn't know. But as we've done our research, it's become more and more clear to us that it's not all foods, that we can't get people to eat enough fruits and vegetables and lean meats, even with, you know, multi-million dollar educational programs to try and get people to increase their fruit and veggie intake. We're just seeing that people aren't doing that. In contrast, when we look at the sorts of foods that when we ask people, what's triggering you to eat this way? It's foods that have unnaturally intensely high levels of refined carbohydrates and or added fats, often both in combination, and that they're typically in these kind of ultra processed food substances that are industrially created products that you, know, you couldn't even make at your home kitchen if you tried, and that they have fiber and water and protein stripped out of them. And so you can eat that you know bag of flaming hot Cheetos or shove those M&Ms in your mouth so much more rapidly than you can with naturally occurring foods, and you digest them more rapidly. They impact your gut and your brain more rapidly and deliver those carbs and those fats to your brain in a naturally intense way. So I've started to really kind of not so much call it food addiction in my own lab, but an addiction to highly processed foods because it doesn't appear to be all foods that trigger this sort of response. You know, Ashley, that's really very, very interesting because you and I know this, that you were born with an innate desire for sweets. There's no, no question about that. And you're right that this could be a problem because you know, you have an orange that you could slice into slices, and then you have those orange slice candies. You know, uh, Ashley, yes. I love those. Don't start with me. Don't start with me, Ashley. I love yeah. those. <laughs> Make a great example. Right. And so what happens is they both have natural the sweetness to it. So I, I like both of them. But you know something? Those six orange candies will be 300 calories. How many oranges that you have to eat? to me, 300 calories. You get sick of peeling after like three oranges. And and what you just said is really spot on in that the natural sweetness is there, but there's also fiber and water. So they're going to fill you up before they fill you out. And when it's refined like that, you can over... Con- I eat that whole bag of orange slices, Ashley. Oh, yeah. Before you ever even start to feel a little full. And then all of a sudden it hits you like a pile of bricks and you're like, I'm, I feel a little sick to my stomach, but you can eat it so rapidly. And that's really one of the underappreciated things about what makes something addictive. It's not just that it gives you you know, a high dose of something that's reinforcing and your brain wakes up and says, that was good, but it hits your system really rapidly. So like nicotine, for example, nicotine exists in nature. Eggplants actually have nicotine, but people are eating eggplants to get, you know, nicotine fixes. It's not a high enough dose and it takes a while to eat an eggplant. But when you have something like an ultra processed tobacco cigarette, it delivers a dose of nicotine at such a high level and at such a fast speed into the brain that that can trigger your reward system to pursue that compulsively. And we see that it's not just about the nicotine with cigarettes, but it's about the flavor additives, the sugar and the cocoa and the menthol and the mouthfeel that is altered through industrially processing attributes to make it taste a certain way. And then people will start to crave the taste of their specific cigarette, even if you've taken the nicotine out. So when I think about how this applies to our food world is that, you know, we've done the same thing to our food supply where we've refined and made more potent and more rapidly absorbed things we are naturally designed to want. We want fat. We want sugar. That was for so much of human history, good for our survival, our brain just is not adapted to these industrial processed foods that just trigger them at a magnitude that can lead to those same sort of compulsive behaviors. So actually, I'm curious, and I think a lot of our listeners will be wondering this as well. What are some of the most addictive foods Mm. that you've identified in your research? Yes. So one of the things that's been most interesting when I did this work is we're actually doing a study and we're trying to create like a picture grid of all sorts of different food cues. And we realized that in nature, foods either come high in carbohydrates, like in that orange that Joan talked about, or high in fat, like some nuts, but that foods don't come high in both 
carbs and fats in nature that, that, you know, breast milk for a short period of our time. But other than that, we don't really get that. When we look at the foods that are most triggering to people, it's those, you know, ultra processed foods that deliver both carbohydrates and fats at high levels rapidly. And these are foods like chocolate, ice cream, pizza, potato chips, French fries. I mean, I've never had anybody be shocked when I (laughs) said those foods. I was like, you gotta be kidding me, ice cream. (laughs) And in contrast, when we ask people, what kind of foods do you not experience these sorts of addictive pull? Some of those foods will be naturally high in sugar, like a banana, or naturally high in fat, like salmon. But in that sort of delivery system and those naturally occurring foods, once you have you know one bite of salmon, you eat four more fillets. Like it, it's not the sorts of behaviors that we see people get triggered. And so it's really that combination that I've seen to be particularly triggering for people. You know, Ashley, how much of this is habit? Because I'm I'm going to share some with you, and uh, you know, just this is our secret, so don't repeat it. So, um, <laughs> and, you know, when I was in, just between us yeah. three, when I was in graduate school, uh, it's quite stressful. And so, when I was stressed, which is mostly daily, I would go home to my apartment and I would call my two best friends, and they were Ben and Jerry. Yeah, and I would um, really, you know, just feel very comforted by Ben and Jerry. Yes. Now. Now, you obviously know we, where we're going with this. So what I started to do was saying, this is ridiculous. Look what I'm do, getting a doctorate and, and for goodness sakes, I'm eating Ben and Jerry's. So I said, you know, I'm stressed. I need another release mechanism. So I started running. And so what, what the trigger was, stress running versus tre- yes. stress Ben and Jerry's. So how much of this is habit? Because we know the Ben and Jerry's works. So habit is a really key component of addiction, broadly. You know, we'll see for people who have gotten addicted to cigarettes and then are trying to quit and we're giving them a nicotine patch. So they're getting nicotine. The habit of of bringing the cigarette to their mouth and the cigarette breaks and the way it just folds into your life, people crave and miss the habit. The habit itself becomes soothing. And, you know, we see that certain things are more or less likely to trigger your habit system where it's hard to break those habits. But it's not just habit. Like I give this example. So I'm a big sports fan. I'm a big University of Michigan sports fan. And when I'm nervous, I will like touch my nails and like kind of mess with my nails when I'm like, make that free throw, kick that extra point. There's nothing inherent about my nails that like drive habit formation. In contrast, addictive substances are really good because they're so potent and powerful. It's stamping in those habits intensely. And then once something is a habit, you don't need as intense of a motivational drive to do it. You know, all of a sudden you're just mindlessly, you know, getting the beer out of the fridge or getting the cigarette out of the pack or getting the cookie out of the, out of the package. And so I think of it as often as a combination of enhanced motivational drive that, you know, I want it, I crave it, I need it. It's a habit. So it's really easy to do. And often we see expectancies are really important. So we develop these cognitive stories that we tell ourselves the Ben and Jerry's will make me feel better. And that what we see in addiction is that oftentimes the substance will stop working as well. Like I've had patients who are like, I don't even get high anymore. But I still think somewhere in my brain that if I just take this hit, it's all going to be better. And so we have done research in my lab that, you know, the expectancies play a big role here too. The expectation we have of emotional relief, of pleasure, of negative affect removal is really key with these ultra processed foods. And that we see that for a lot of people who have this more addictive profile, they have a really negative expectancies about healthier foods. So they'll say, if I eat a salad or I eat the, you know, the fruit or the chicken breast, I'm going to feel deprived, angry, upset. And so there's this imbalance between the expectations of what the different foods are going to do for them. So Ashley, just a follow-up quick question, because really what happens is that, that Ben and Jerry's gave me that dopamine, that, that hit. And so what I did is I ran and then the running got the hit and then and then so really what I had to do was to say I need that hit and okay and, and and right and so I had to train myself I'm stressed I go running yeah and it took me a while to do that so in essence people can remember that that can be done instead of releasing it through food you can release it on the walking path 
I fully agree with you. And that's a big part of addiction treatment is actually saying, what are your cues? What are your motivations? What are your triggers? And so for a lot of those cues, it's environmental. So it'll be like your couch at 6 p.m. And then the next thing you know, the habit has been triggered. You're only half aware of it. You're like a zombie, right? In the fridge. So we'll kind of say, okay, it's six o'clock. You're not on your couch, right? You got to be, go to a coffee shop. You got to be on a walk. Let's break up the cues. But also for, you know, what is key about addiction is this ability to kind of shift mood. And it can be subtle, like with cigarettes or food where, you know, you're not so blissed out or high that you can't function, but they're still able to induce pleasure and reduce negative affect to a magnitude that we start to rely on them and finding alternative ways to experience pleasure and to regulate your emotions is an essential part of treatment. I often think about, you know, when I think of our world broadly, um, it feels like through technology, we've refined things that used to be enjoyable, like interacting with another person. And we've hit it where you get these like quick, fast hits, like somebody liked your social media post, but it doesn't sustain you. And so I often try and think about getting rewards that I call them are kind of more low and slow. So like you're going on that run, you're talking to that friend, you're reading a good book, but that can be hard when your brain is used to a fast, immediate, convenient hit of reward. And it can take some time for those habits to be replaced. Mm, Those are great points. And, you know, you talk about, you know, how the brain is is reacting to these mm-hmm. different you know foods or rewards or drugs behaviors i'd love to dig a little deeper yeah. into that because i've i've had this experience you know we talked about these different foods where you know i love strawberries but i've never yeah. eaten so many strawberries that i've gotten sick to my stomach but that's been the case with strawberry ice cream um, yeah. and so i just yeah. you know i either don't keep it in the house or if it's in the freezer, I don't even take a bite because I know I'm going to, you know, probably overeat it. So can you talk about how our yeah. brains react differently to some of those highly addictive foods like strawberry ice cream yes. versus the natural nice foods like strawberries, for instance? Yes. What's going on in the brain? Absolutely. So I'll start a little bit with the substance itself, and then I'll talk a little bit about what seems to change for people who are starting to show that addictive profile. And again, just as Joan said, like I often always really try and put the message out there for like radical self-compassion because our brains were designed and engineered to find fat, to find sugar rewarding. And that helped us get enough calories to survive the next famine, to have enough energy to reproduce. And so it makes sense that our brain finds this enjoyable. But what we are seeing is that, especially in these versions that are giving you salt and fat at such high levels, that the moment, especially sweet taste, hits your tongue, that there's a direct relationship between what's happening and the Oreo sensory process of the smell and the taste. It's going right up to the dopamine system of the brain. We call it the mesolimbic dopamine system. And it's really that system that makes you feel drive and urge and want. It also kind of stamps in cues that says, oh, this cue that just, I saw that Ben and Jerry's pint of ice cream. And then this got delivered, like pay attention the next time you see that container, which would have been helpful if you're like, oh good, there's berries when I see this one bush, right? Like that, I'm going to remember that in the future, I'll feel motivated to get it. Here, when you're tasting it, you're getting that reward, that pleasure, the dopamine system is getting activated. And there's also evidence that when you're getting that, especially that sweet taste, that it activates your endogenous opioid system and your endogenous cannabinoid system. So the things that make opioids and cannabis pleasurable, we already have those neurotransmitters in our brain and that the food leads to that release. And when we think of the opioids and endocannabinoids, they're kind of the more blissy pleasure sort of feeling that kind of really nice relaxing where the dopamine is like, I want it. The opioids and the endocannabinoids give you that kind of pleasure bliss. And one of the things that we've talked about a little bit that is only recently dawning on me is how different the textures are in ultra processed food. You know, our brain's want to kind of numb out. If you're getting the same reward and it's the same thing over and over and over again, and it's there's nothing new to learn, our brain will start tuning out to it. But something as 
slight, a slight difference is having, even if it tastes exactly the same, slightly different colors. That's why M&Ms with multiple colors, people will eat more than if it's all the same color. That makes your brain say, oh, I got to keep paying attention. There's new colors. And when I think of the textures of ultra processed food, like a banana always kind of tastes like a banana throughout. But the Ben and Jerry strawberry cheesecake ice cream, it's got these little like crunchy nuggets in it. And then there's a strawberry chunk and a swirl of, you know, cream in there. And it's hard in my mouth and then it melts. And so because the textures are so variable and constantly changing and shifting in a way that isn't as common and real minimally processed foods, our brain just keeps going, hey, oh, wow, something new, new bite, new texture, new flavor, and it doesn't zone out. And what we see is that especially for people who are prone to an addictive response, it stops being so much about the actual joy or pleasure that you get from the substance, but that those cues become so salient and they become the big drivers of the dopamine release. So when you see the Golden Archers or the Ben and Jerry and the drugstore, seeing those cues and those brands, it floods the brain with the dopamine wanting, desire, craving. And so even you want it so bad that even if you're eating it and you're like, oh, it's not as good as I remember, you're going to keep going. You know, that's funny, uh, actually not funny, but that I should say is, is uh, so interesting uh, because I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how the environment and and, and, oh, yeah. and, and plays on, on the fact that you want to be eating and eating more. It can't be understated enough how important the environment is. I always think of addiction, any addiction, as I always call it the three-legged stool. So there's the addictiveness of the substance itself. So something like water, you know, there's a water fountain all the time, but it doesn't make me prone to drink water to the point where I'm, you know, overhydrated and you know, don't have enough sodium in my blood because the water isn't addictive. Now, if that was like a wine fountain that like every time I'm stressed, you know, that'd be a different story because that's an addictive substance. We see that, you know, individuals differ. Most people who use an addictive substance don't get fully addicted to it. You know, 90% of people drink alcohol. Estimates are, you know, 15 to 18% will develop an actual problem with alcohol. So your risk factors, your genetics, depression, trauma exposures, your reward propensities in your brain really interact with the substance. But the environment is huge. So when we think of something like cocaine, which, you know, the impact that has on your dopamine system is so intense, it really, you know, leads to like over a thousand percent release of dopamine in the brain, whereas sugar and fat and nicotine and alcohol, they're all around, you know, around 150 to 200 percent above baseline of dopamine um, in the reward centers of the brain. So why aren't we all just super addicted to cocaine? Well, it's not an environment where you're constantly triggered, you're constantly exposed, you go to pump your gas and you go to pay and there's like cocaine at the (laughs) checkout, you know, (laughs) you're not like walking by a vending machine for cocaine as you're like going about your day. (laughs) The environment is huge. And we've seen that that can be an opportunity for intervention that, you know, tobacco, we didn't find some amazing treatment that led to a huge reduction in tobacco. We didn't educate people fully out of it, but we really changed the environment around smoking cigarettes. We reduced marketing. um, We reduced the targeting of children. We reduced vending machines for cigarettes. We altered the economics of it. And all of those changes to the environment is really where the public health payoff was. And I've had people say some individuals who have this addictive profile with their intake of highly processed foods have experienced other addictions. And they've said, this is so much harder. You know, I was having a problem with, you know, Xanax, but I'm not triggered all the time by it. Whereas my, you know, my highly processed food fixes, I'm just constantly inundated. And so it's really hard to navigate that environment. Like, let's say you wanted to avoid it, right? Like if you go to the grocery store, we now see that the majority of the food supply in the United States is ultra processed foods that are high and, you know, refined carbs and added fat. Yeah, I think the question is is not where can you find these foods, but where can't you? I mean, even if exactly. you're driving down, you know, the road on an interstate in the middle of nowhere and you pull up to a gas station to put gas in your car, yes. there are, you know, all these junk foods 
uh, these highly palatable foods that we're talking about. Libraries, you know, federal buildings, yeah. vending machines, they are just everywhere. And then, of hospitals. course, hospitals. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, when you're home, we all have pantries and cabinets yeah. full of, you know, these these foods that last forever. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that I find really interesting is that there's this idea and addiction of like kind of cultural gating. And it's this idea that let's say for alcohol, we have these cultural norms that, you know, you typically don't drink till after 5 PM. And so there's this kind of it's called like occasion setters that tell you when the cue that you're seeing is good to go or not. And so if I'm working from home, let's say, and I have a bottle of wine on my kitchen counter, like before 5 p.m., it's not that salient or appealing to me. I'm not like, oh, it's 11 a.m. Should I, you know, like maybe <laughs> how you, the occasion is not turned on. And that's kind of doing a lot of the willpower for me. And then at 5 p.m., the occasion setter changes, right? Mm. Happy hour. Duh. <laughs> and then if I want to resist, I need to use some of my own resources. And we see this in countries like in Italy, where alcohol is a large part of the culture, but there's a lot of cultural occasion setters for when and where and how it's okay to drink, usually with other people, usually not to intoxication, usually with food. So even though alcohol is really prevalent, we don't see very high levels of alcohol use disorders in Italy. In our current society, it's not just that the foods have changed, but the occasion setters have changed in which every occasion is now an appropriate time to be eating ultra processed foods. And that's not an accident. It's through marketing, you know, have your fourth meal, you know, it's it's snack time, you're feeling a little hangry, go get your Snickers. So there's this normalization of all times and all places are completely appropriate to have these foods. And because a lot of engineering from the food industry has gone into making the food shelf stable and convenient, they're just sitting around for you. And so you can drive in your car while you kind of shake, you know, the little Oreo bag into your mouth in a way that's different than the foods we've had in the past. You know, and and Ashley, you're right, because that five o'clock scenario and and when it comes to what what our day was like, i.e. the stress level, but also have yeah. we eaten all day long? And so you're skipping yeah. meals and then at the end of the day, you're hungry. Oh, yeah. And on a neurobiological level, we're really starting to understand how much the hunger signals that you're calorically deprived and the reward signals of the brain are intimately intertwined, not just in the context of food and eating, but also with other addictive drugs. That if you, for example, smoke a cigarette and you're hungry, you're gonna, even though it's not going through your gut, you're gonna get a bigger reward burst. If you see that cue for the bar and you're hungry, you appear to be more vulnerable to it because the gut hormones like ghrelin and orexin that are telling you I'm hungry, I need food, actually go up and they kind of potentiate, they kind of prime the pump of the dopamine system of your brain. And so I've always been really interested in that in AA, they've told people, you know, don't get hungry. Like that is going to set you up to relapse. It's going to make you more vulnerable to the cues. You're less emotionally regulated and you have less inhibitory control. And we're seeing right now these, you know, new obesity medications. There's some anecdotal evidence that you know, they really seem to hit the satiety signal and make you feel kind of fuller and kind of reduce the degree to which your brain thinks it's it's starving. And so it seems to maybe also reduce people's drive for alcohol and other addictive substances. That'll be really interesting to follow up. So I think a lot of this and why, again, I think it's important to not just say it's all foods is that for a lot of people, I'll say, we want you to be eating three meals one or two snacks a day of real whole nourishing foods and to do that regularly. Cause if you've been white knuckling it all day and you're only eating 500 calories and you're going to get home at that couch when you're stressed at the end of the day and you're just setting yourself up to fail. And we see that ultra processed foods, they don't trigger the satiety signals of the body as effectively as the same amount of calories and a you know real food. And so even though you might be eating a lot of calories, if it's in this ultra processed kind of addictive sort of substance, it's not letting the satiety signals help you clamp down on the reward response as effectively. Mm, wow, that's just incredible. I'd, I'd love to see some follow-up on you know this notion that these new obesity medications, the GLP-1 mm-hmm. inhibitors, you know, how they're affecting yeah. these other addictions and, and behaviors. That would be fascinating. I, I think you'd be a great person to potentially do a study <laughs> on that. But I'm curious, 
you know, since we talk about classifying potentially some foods as being, you know, potentially addictive, is there a downside or an upside of classifying some foods as potentially addictive and others not? Yeah. So I would say, you know, the first thing that really worried me about doing this work was the potential of double stigmatizing people. You know, we already know that not all individuals with an addictive response to these highly processed foods have obesity or overweight. There's lots of ways one can mask your relationship with food, or you might have a high metabolism, or you might be young. And for there's so many different pathways to people having a higher body mass index, a higher weight. So one take home is you can't look at somebody's body and think you know their relationship with food. That's why we really wanted to focus on these behavioral indicators of addiction rather than saying, oh, somebody weighs this much, they must be addicted. But we know that the stigma against individuals with obesity is one of our most vicious stigmas in society, and it's not getting better. So my group and other groups have done research to look into this addictive frame, that there's an addictive process going on and these food substances are addictive. And I was really relieved to see that it actually seemed in, uh, to either be neutral or to reduce stigma by kind of putting the focus not just on our current narrative that it's just willpower and you know calories in, calories out, just try a little harder, it's that easy, why aren't you doing it? But to really focus on, you know, there's a trillion dollar industry designing these food products to hit your bliss point and maximize craveability. Like that's really challenging to navigate, especially if you have certain vulnerabilities. So that was a downside I was worried about, but it doesn't seem to have borne out a lot. I do think a lot about eating disorders and especially eating disorders where people can have very black and white rigid thinking where, you know, if I have, you know, one bite of ice cream, I am a bad person with low worth. And we think a lot about communicating this to people. I've struggled a little bit because if these foods are are truly addictive and we're telling people who are losing control of them and binging on them, oh no, no, it's not about the food. You know, these there's nothing about the strawberries versus the strawberry cheesecake. It's just the way you're relating to the food that's the problem. Well, to me, that feels a little bit like gaslighting because there is very much something about the strawberry cheesecake and the way it was designed to make it harder to resist. For me, I think about this a lot and that people will think that addiction means abstinence only, right? And for some people, that is what they need. But for many people, there are scientifically supported treatments that help people consume in moderation and safe context. So you might never be able to have Bacardi 151 again. That's too potent. But you might be able to learn to have a glass of wine with dinner with safe friends. To me, that pathway strikes me as a particularly relevant in the context of these harm reduction models of addiction with these sorts of foods that it's not like, okay, you can only have, you know, fruits and vegetables and chicken breast for the rest of your life. But how do we think about this in a moderate, flexible way? And what you put, you know, what food you eat or what the number on the scale is, that's not your worth as a person like that, that just broadly is not what we want to communicate here. And I see that a lot in eating disorders. The benefit I see is that right now, if these substances truly are addictive and they are triggering people in this compulsive way, we are not protecting our children at all from the intense marketing that, you know, over 50% of calories um, for children in the U.S. are these kind of addictive ultra processed foods, that there's a huge social justice issue because we all have to eat. And for people with nutrition insecurity who can't get access to nourishing foods, they have no choice but to rely on these foods. And if we treat them all the same, it's just calories We just had a study come out that people with food insecurity are showing more signs of addictive, highly processed food intake. That's what they have access to, and they're highly stressed. And so there's a social justice that in the same way, there's some countries right now where you can't get access to clean water in developing countries. And so people rely on soda to get safe hydration. We look at that and say that's so unfair and that's bad for their health. But kind of in our food supply for certain parts, for certain Americans, you know, the main access to calories is that. And then I think that brings up this idea of corporate responsibility of it can't just be solely a focus on the individual, but we need to consider the role of the, you know, the industries creating, marketing these foods and the environment in which they, you know, need to be restrained. 
Well, that is just an incredible way to frame it and think about it. And I think that's really been food for thought, pardon the pun. Yeah, I think this really you know, helps to address the science behind it. And like you said, you're addressing the potential stigmatization, also sort of providing people some relief and hope and reassurance that this isn't necessarily about your willpower. In, in many cases, it's about, you know, the food and the environment and all these other factors that, you know, cause you to lose control. And I think that for a lot of people can be empowering. So I really want to to thank you for sharing these thoughts and insights and your incredible research. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for this. It's such an important topic that affects all of us in one way or another. Yeah, it's absolutely my pleasure to share. And again, that that notion of hope, like I do see things changing. Um, and I, you know, I'm really excited to see where we are in 10 years. And hopefully, you know, we've kind of set up our food environment so it supports health and not profits. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Thank you so much. Those were such incredible insights. I have always been fascinated by Dr. Gearhart's research and this whole topic of food addiction. But Dr. Joan, I know you have a more nuanced take on this. So what did you think about what she had to say about food addiction? Has it changed your thoughts or opinions on it? Where do you stand on this issue? You know, it's, it's hashtag fascinating, okay? I know from the research that environment, genetics play a part, socioeconomic status plays a part, but you know something? The food addiction does. I mean, there is something going on. There's a dopamine hit for some people based on the foods that they eat, and I really, really found this quite compelling. Yeah, that's a great point. I think that this is a very controversial topic for a lot of good reasons, and it's so complex and nuanced, but there's clearly something there that we need to look further into. So this is going to be a really incredible field to continue following for some time. You know, Anahab, that's why we do this. We do controversial topics. I mean, you know, really? That's what we're all about. We hope you found this episode both educational and entertaining. But remember, we're not providing you with individual medical advice. So take your family's medical questions to your doctor, especially before starting any new diet or health routine. And for medical emergencies, contact emergency services. And don't forget to subscribe to Body Unbox wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss out on any bonus content. I'll be reading relevant content from my book by Pearson Nutrition and You, and we'll go even deeper into the science behind food addiction. Also, if you're looking for more in-depth learning experiences on anatomy and physiology or other topics, sign up for Pearson Plus today at pearsonplus.com to explore content from experts like Dr. Joan Salji Blake. Thank you so much for joining us on today's episode of Body Unboxed by Pearson.